thank you. Uh, delighted to be here. Uh, I think of things in good news and bad news. Uh, the bad news is my talk is nowhere near as exciting as Nicole's. Uh, the good news is I now know what an exercise snack is. Uh, I think in my household, my kids would have interpreted that a little bit differently than you described. But uh, so just by a show of hands, how many of you have heard or at least vaguely familiar with what lean is? And I'm not talking about weight here either. So uh, that two, the two, okay. So um, we'll talk a little bit about lean. It's basically a philosophy towards quality improvement that lots of organizations adopt. It has lots of different techniques. Uh, if there was any true experts in lean, they'd probably roll over right now if I made the analogy that I'm about to make. Lean to me is very similar to yoga. It's a philosophy that has lots of techniques, uh, and the more you do it, perhaps more of the benefits might accrue. And this is sort of something that organizations have done to try to improve quality uh, and IU Health has been uh, on a journey of adopting lean techniques into its operations uh, for at least five or six years now. Uh, and my talk today is uh, designed to sort of talk about some of the things that have been learned during that process. I do want to acknowledge several of my uh, co-conspirators on this, including folks from IU Health and uh, other folks from the Fairbanks School of Public Health. Uh, we just got together and sort of brainstormed what can we do that would be helpful to decision makers at IU Health in terms of uh, how they run their operations, what would simultaneously be of interest to the literature around organizations and lean implementation in organizations, uh, and we eventually somehow gravitated towards this topic. And so we have now been in ongoing analysis of some data, ongoing understanding each other's perspectives. I think this is very consistent with sort of the learning health system that we've been talking about that uh, Peter has been sharing with us his vision for, uh, but it involves using research tools and practice managers uh, to sort of find ways to um, improve both our knowledge overall and the operations of the organization. So let me kind of frame this up. Several, the next three, four slides aren't going to be new. We spend a lot of money per person on healthcare in the United States. Uh, the most recent figures actually puts us at around 10,000 per person. Uh, that's about two and a half times the average of the industrialized countries. Uh, and as you probably are aware, we also don't always get our money's worth. Uh, and we'll get to the fact that we pay a lot and don't always get our money's worth in a second. But I think what's as important is we have separated from the pack uh, during our lifetimes, during our lifetime in terms of spending on healthcare. Now, in addition, lots of relatively good evidence on how we spend that dollar suggests that we are very wasteful. In fact, Reasonable estimates suggest that about 40% of every dollar we send, we spend on healthcare is probably wasteful, either on something that we could have easily prevented or on something that we don't need. Uh, and so lots of our costs and our runaway costs uh, probably have the ability to be uh, reduced with some kind of philosophy or some kind of technique or some kind of change to how we are doing things. I think it's a little bit outside the scope of my talk to talk about all the contributing factors to why that is, but uh, I'd love to have that discussion offline if someone is interested. This slide gets back to what do we get for our money? And so if we had the healthiest population on the planet, maybe spending two and a half times uh, what everyone else does wouldn't be a bad thing. Uh, and we'd be proud of the fact that we can spend that as a relatively rich nation. But I think most people would agree we're not getting our money's worth. And that starts talking about value. So we're spending a lot, not getting a lot, in part because many of our outcomes typically rank either in the D minus or C plus range uh, when we compare ourselves to other countries around the world. And so simultaneously, uh, we have all these policy foci that are forcing healthcare providers and frankly, everyone in the healthcare industry to focus intensely on reducing costs. 
sometimes separately to focus on improving quality and improving outcomes. This is everything from engaging patients to improving patient satisfaction to improving the quality of fill in the blank disease care. Uh, all of this is happening, but implicit in both improvements of, of quality and reduction in costs is this need to improve processes. And processes define the sequences and the work steps that involve in delivering care, uh, especially in resource intensive environments like hospitals. There are literally millions of steps that workers and hospitals have to engage in, whether they're clinical or non-clinical, that together make up the care that's received by an individual patient. And so when you start thinking about process improvement, it's very difficult to ignore what outside of healthcare organizations have done. Uh, and many of them, especially in the manufacturing businesses, have come up with very prescribed and specific methodologies to improve processes. Uh, Toyota has been credited with one of the probably largest wide-scale implementations of one of those approaches called Lean, uh, and it's about reducing processes to the essential pieces of it such that it reduces the amount of defects produced, it reduces overproduction of services and or goods, uh, it reduces waiting time, it reduces talent being wasted, uh, it reduces transportation needs and costs, inventory, motion, and extra processing. And so at the heart of it, Lean is based on this continuous quality improvement idea that strives to reduce non-value adding activities, processes, variations, and or work, poor work conditions. And so, not surprisingly, lots of authors and lots of writers and, uh, and researchers have tried to apply this idea of lean to healthcare settings. And this is probably represent representative of dozens and dozens of books that have been written and dozens and dozens of articles that have been trying to apply pieces of the lean philosophy to the healthcare environment. One of the most common uh, uh, techniques from the lean bag of tricks is known as the rapid improvement event. And the RIE is basically where a group that works together gets together to huddle for a couple of days, maybe a week, about one specific aspect where the group frankly discusses all the moving parts, what is trying to be accomplished, all the data on where the bottlenecks are in a given process, where there might be waste, where there's confusion, where there's waiting, and lines it up, usually on a whiteboard, to identify things that could be changed or eliminated to make the process more lean. Um, then immediate testing occurs uh, during this three, four, five day rapid improvement event. Uh, and then more data is collected on what did we do to the process? Did we reduce wait times? Did we improve something? Are people less confused? Is there uh, more satisfaction between different members of the team? Are patients affected adversely, positively, et cetera? And then basically once that occurs and learning has happened, then decisions are made on what to permanently change about that process in that unit, in that situation moving forward. Uh, and so IU Health, uh, like many hospitals, and the most recent data we have is something like 70 hospitals engage in something related to lean or quality improvement or process improvement in general, but a relatively minority of health systems and hospitals are all in where they're doing this on a large enough scale that it would be considered enterprise-wide. And so the literature is focused on, oh, here are all the benefits of thinking this way. Here are some implementation barriers. Uh, here are some case studies of what we learned and what we did. But generally speaking, most of the literature has been described as patchy and fragmented and deployed in pockets of best practice, as opposed to what can be learned by doing this at a large scale, multi-hospital, uh, what ultimately results uh, as a, you know, uh, with investments in all the effort and the training and the time that's required to do this. 
And so, uh, in part because of calls in the literature to evaluate the impact of lean implementations across hospital systems, uh, IU Health and us partnered. IU Health obviously started their uh, focus on lean before we got into the picture. But once we heard that this was potentially the largest lean implementation in any US hospital based health system, I said, this might be something really important. And we kept on listening to what the managers were saying. We've been doing this for years. We think we have a lot of information. We want to figure out how and how much to continue to invest uh, in this lean inv uh, enterprise. Uh, we want to know where we can get more bang for our buck. We think we've addressed some of the low hanging fruit, but how can we sort of take this to the next level? And knowing what we knew about the literature, we said, you know, this looks like a good match in terms of being able to line up their interests and the interests of scientists in this area. And so by 2017, when we started collaborating with the folks at the health system, they had conducted over a thousand rapid improvement events in all 17 hospitals, the outpatient clinics, uh, the health plan, everything that's sort of under the IU health umbrella. And this information had never been analyzed, uh, at least not systematically. It was obviously used piecemeal to uh, affect decision making, but we said, why don't we do something with this? And so we sat around and sort of came up with these research questions. Uh, the first question that was unclear to anyone was, what proportion of these rapid improvement events even result in a benefit? Uh, I remember folks saying, oh, it's almost all. And then I, in the same room, people who've been doing this with the health system said, no, probably about a, a, ha a third, maybe a quarter to a third. And then there was this definition of how do you define benefit? And like everyone had different measures of benefit, all of which had been documented, but in each person's mind, it meant something slightly different. Uh, and then someone even said, what do you consider a successful rapid improvement event, and it wasn't always one that was necessarily uh, resulting in a benefit. If we learned that what we're doing was good, some people said that was successful. Others said, no, successful is if we finished it to, brought it to completion. And so we started having these interesting discussions on how to analyze this. We ultimately came down with uh, what proportion of these RIEs, rapid improvement events, have benefits. Uh, what sort of, how did the nature of benefits change over time as the health system became more heavily invested and increasingly more engaged in these rapid improvement events? And ultimately, to answer the question of where they can invest more or where they can put more attention, uh, what settings and what employee characteristics and employees that would lead these rapid improvement events was everyone from front level staff to senior vice presidents to clinical folks to non-clinical folks depending on what it was people signed up to sort of look at in a, uh, a rapid improvement event on something that affected their work area and so some of these employees were higher ranked some of them were lower ranked some of them clinical some of them not clinical some of them had previous experience with running rapid improvement events, some of them did not. We wanted to see whether or not there was more bang for the buck, depending on the setting or uh, on the employee characteristic. And so uh, all the data is gonna come from IU Health Enterprise Information Systems at this point. Uh, I'm gonna show you the data. So all the data came from the various different enterprise information systems at the health system. We know where the rapid improvement of, uh, event took place, we know what setting it was, emergency department, surgery, medicine, whatever. Uh, we know the time period, we know the year, we know the month, uh, we know the characteristics of the employee, as I mentioned. Um, and we're gonna pool all the data across the uh, time period that we have. And the unit of analysis is this rapid improvement event. So we're effectively meta-analyzing a thousand plus events to see what trends we can identify. Uh, the human subjects uh, committee determined this to be not human subjects, uh, which is always a delight to hear. So the binary variable is, was there a benefit, yes or no, defined as any one of these benefits that you see on the screen that are designed to mirror basically the lean approach of what lean focuses on. 
And so you saw when I showed the slide with Toyota, some of the benefits could be say dollar savings and those dollar savings could either be real dollars that you know ultimately have an effect on a balance sheet or they could be soft cost savings that might be saving money indirectly like for example not having a physician have to uh, document something that's being documented somewhere else that would be a soft money savings um, time savings uh, would be measured in minutes uh, reduction in clinical defects are mostly talking about errors of either omission or commission. Uh, workflow steps saved is just talking about efficiency in the process and a reduction in errors that are non-clinical in nature that creates confusion. Uh, also, all of these rapid improvement events ultimately said what kind of savings there was, what kind of benefit, and was required to estimate it. And the estimation occurred by the team that did it, uh, and that had to be validated by either the CFO or the COO of the hospital where it took place, uh, depending on whether it was financial or operational in nature. And so we got reasonable estimates of how much each individual rapid improvement event might have saved the health system. So ends it up being about 1144 rapid improvement events. Uh, you could see many of them occurred in the inpatient setting, but uh, they're distributed across pretty much all the different uh, settings that IU Health has, uh, Department of Surgery, Emergency Department, Ancillary Services, a specific service line, a business service line, uh, outpatient clinics, Department of Medicine specifically. Uh, and the types of folks that have led this, you could see here, ranged from senior administrators, which were presidents, senior VPs, executive VPs, all the way down to non-managers. Uh, there's a lot of ranks unknown in the HR system, and it's not because IU Health doesn't know people's ranks, it's because they don't know people's ranks at the time that the event might have occurred. I guess the system doesn't capture it in a way that allowed us to dial back three, four years and say, you know, what was uh, Sean's rank at that time? All they know is his current rank, at least from the data set that we had access to. Um, and you could see uh, there were 49 rapid improvement events conducted in 2013, and that number jumped to around two to 300 uh, per year uh, in every year since. And, uh, Almost 92% of all the rapid improvements ultimately successfully completed, and about 45% of them resulted in some measurable benefit to the organization. Uh, and so the first thing was that shocked some people. Uh, success was a good thing, but uh, uh, I, I think we put some numbers on it, and I think that was helpful to some of the discourse. When you look across the years, uh, and this is a breakdown of uh, the benefits that were realized by year with uh, that, I guess, gray is the real cost savings, which is dominating uh, the first couple of years. By the way, a given rapid improvement event can have multiple benefits. That wasn't always the case, but that's why the numbers don't necessarily add up to 100, because uh, a successful one could have saved some money and saved some time. Uh, and so you could see how the mix has over time went from a focus on real cost savings to also include uh, a time savings, which in the most recent year of our data became the majority uh, benefit realized. All the other benefits were less likely to occur, but more common in more recent years. When we estimated how much benefit accrued from the average uh, RIE that ultimately had, say, a cost savings. And what we found was 29% of RIEs resulted in some kind of cost savings, which had an average of about $148,000 to the health system and cost savings. And you can see the range there is very wide and why um, the median is a little is lower than the, the average. And so we have medians uh, presented also. Time savings occurred in about 11% of RIEs resulted in some kind of time saved. And it was on average uh, 1,600 annual hours saved in someone doing some kind of task. 
uh, reduction in clinical defects uh, resulted in about 2.8% of RIEs, and that uh, you can see the number of occurrences, again, very wide uh, ranges, uh, and workflow steps saved and reduction in non-clinical defects were less commonly uh, observed, and you could see sort of the occurrences there. We ran all of this uh, in fancy regressions, adjusting for time of the year, the month, uh, looking for seasonality, all the setting characteristics, all the employee characteristics. I could present that the numbers don't change or the results don't change, and it's just a little bit more intuitive to, to consume the information based on uh, just the rates of how often this occurs in each of these groups. And so this is uh, in the first column, any benefit, uh, whether or not that was realized, that was that 45% of all RIEs had any benefit. And one of the things we saw was that there was a significant uh, increase in the number of any benefits observed in the emergency department. So we're comparing the highlighted number to 45. At least that's what would be occurring in the adjusted model. Uh, you could see outpatient clinics were less likely to have benefits. Uh, let's see if I highlighted that. I did. So in the emergency department, uh, there's so much resource allocation being happening that there might be more opportunities to reduce waste. And we believe that was one of the reasons after talking with some of the folks uh, on the floors. On the outpatient side, they had less benefits. And one of the reasons that we sort of talked about was outpatient settings are usually run by the physician group. And there is potentially insufficient full alignment between what's happening at the health system and what's happening in the physician practice plan. And this sort of highlighted the further need to figure out how to maximally align the interests of the two entities, uh, because it seems like it might have implications for the ability to do the kinds of things that both the physicians and the health system would benefit from as we move increasingly into value-based payments. We saw that the emergency department benefits that were more likely to accrue were most frequently more likely to accrue because there was an more, a higher rate of observing real cost savings. And when you put yourself in this emergency department mindset, so many resources are being deployed that are expensive in such a short period of time that the natural focus in that environment is to identify something that will save dollars in order to ultimately uh, be most beneficial. Uh, in the Department of Medicine, most of the focus, and it was significantly at a higher rate, was on soft cost savings. And if you recall, soft cost savings included things like not making physicians have to document something that might be captured somewhere else. And that makes a lot of sense because if you're in the Department of Medicine, you're probably looking at it from the perspective of a clinical provider and time is of the essence and efficiencies is what's prioritized in, in that setting. Um, in the inpatient setting, there was also um, uh, an increased likelihood of observing a reduction in some kind of error of omission or commission. And when you think about how inpatient care is reimbursed, it's always been on a prospective payment DRG system where any kind of clinical defect costs the hospital both time, effort, and money, and is separately bad for the patient. And so you could see where the focus ended up being on trying to identify defects or clinical improvements, quality improvements in that setting. Very quickly, when we looked at uh, employee, what we found, and this was actually delightful, uh, the lowest ranked employees were associated with the highest likelihood of having any benefit. I saw a hand from Titus. Yes, yeah, sorry, you mowed it on a little bit too fast. So the Department of Medicine is not an IO Health Department. So this was the School of Medicine, Department of Medicine, uh, you know, doing its own RIEs. That so it's the Department of Medicine folks who practice at IU Health. So it would be almost all clinical. It's not the School of Medicine's Department of Medicine looking at its own operations. Sorry about that. So the lowest level non-managers uh, 
were observed to have benefits at the highest rates. And at first, my first inclination was maybe they're overestimating it because they just want to do a better job. Uh, and that's unlikely given that these numbers have to be validated by lots of folks, including the CFO and the COO. But what we found was is that they were more likely to have benefits in time saved or soft cost savings. Uh, and I think what the revelation here was is that you have lots of talented folks in the health system that are regularly observing things that they can affect. And if given a vehicle and support and the structure to do so, that could result in substantial benefits to the organization. Uh, we are now talking with IU Health about ways to utilize leading RIEs as a way to advance yourself in the organization, giving more support and more leeway uh, for, I think, what would be considered idle talent sitting and waiting to be activated by uh, the, a learning health system. And so what are our current takeaways? You know, savings and both real dollars and other benefits seem to be accruing as a result of these investments. Uh, the mix of benefits tend to change over time, uh, but there seems to be a worthwhile and tangible takeaway from things that are being done. Uh, and we think a couple of papers are gonna stem out of some of this preliminary analysis that not only will showcase what we have learned here, but also perhaps provide some evidence for other health systems to embark on a similar journey as well. So let me stop there and see if anyone has any comments or questions, or I'd be delighted to engage in dialogue. Sean. Um, your great presentation. I had two questions. First of all, I wanted to clarify the outpatient a point you made uh, where there was lack of alignment between the hospital. I'll, I'll just say something concretely so you can either confirm or deny. Are you saying that there was less um, benefits realized because outpatient folks weren't going to see the benefits, weren't, you know, weren't driven by their leadership to participate? What, say more about what, what caused that, what you think caused that to be. Lost. Yeah. So, and importantly, we don't know for sure. This is what I, I will even say I am hypothesizing might be a discussion point for that finding uh, after digging and talking with folks. But I think what you said is exactly right. Uh, the benefits of that might accrue in the outpatient setting might not be immediately realized by the folks in the outpatient setting and might be accrued at the system level. Mm -hmm. And so that might be, is what I was arguing, a barrier uh, and that's where alignment of those benefits and uh, could use some attention. Okay, great. And then there was a, a number point when you looked at, you had a table with the benefits accrued, you had hours saved and yeah, here it is. So were those, were the average and medians of the 28% and the 10% or was that over the entire population? Okay. Yeah, the average was of the 28.8%. So of a RIE that experienced a real cost savings, this is what you typically saw. So then do you have overall numbers if you look? Yeah, we can change the denominator very easily and just assume it's about half of these because 45% had a benefit, so the other half did not. I guess what I'm wondering, for example, the one to 2.2 million save that you saw there, was that burned in the 60 or the 72 percent that didn't see a? Was there actually because there's cost in implementing lean, right? And so I'm just wondering if the cost of implementing the other 72 percent outweighed the savings. That yeah, so that's one of our other planned analyses is okay. to do like a cost, a formal cost benefit analysis of what was invested vis-a-vis -vis what was accrued. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're just not there yet. And estimating the costs are actually kind of difficult. Uh, one would argue this is what people are supposed to do in certain positions already. And so just getting a percentage of someone's time that would have gotten to what they were supposed to do already is a little bit tricky to estimate. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I saw Nicole's hand first and then Titus. So I, I, I had a similar question about sort of the net cost savings. And I think it's important to probably figure that out as well because IU Health invested a lot even up front into the structure to teach people how to do these REIs. And so I think that's... So I, I'm going to... I think a cost benefit and maybe even a cost effectiveness analysis is due. 
However, the business of quality improvement in any organization is a cost of business for everyone. Trying to say whether or not we should or should not invest in quality improvement starts putting us, I think, on a slippery slope. Sure. Uh, this process in particular. It, this process in particular, and that's where estimating the costs associated with this process in particular is challenging. So, and yeah. I, another question. So I know you said there was validation from the CFO and the COO regarding the the savings. Who were the raters who actually said, yeah, I'm going to put this in the soft savings bucket or I'm going to put this in the hard savings bucket? Is, well, it was collaborative. So the team who ran the ROI, who determined what benefit was accrued, uh, said they ticked the boxes in terms of what it was. Mm -hmm. They then estimated it. And then the CFO and the CO also validated that that was correct. Okay. And the annualized amount was pretty much done based on the volume of how often that process occurs and how many defects occur. And so, uh, okay. Yeah. We are, we are at time. Uh, okay. What I might suggest is Titus, why don't you bring the question up? I want to be respectful of people. Thank you. So.